Welcome back to All Hell Can't Stop Us. I'm Jeff Clinton. This is my weekly vlog slash podcast slash broadcast of the world, what's going on in my life and the world around me. And as an alternative to the radio, the commercial radio, as well as Spotify and Netflix and the RIAA and the MPAA. So, uh, as usual, I have music and some things to talk about lined up today. Unfortunately, I think all of my guests have bailed and forgot what day it was and that sort of thing, which is kind of unfortunate. But I do try to bring people onto this show. So if there's someone interesting that you think that I should talk to, definitely send me an email, Jeffrey, that's J-F-F-R-E-Y dot cliff at gmail.com or get a hold of me by Ricochet or post a comment on one of these threads, basically suggesting I should talk to them because the goal of this show is to bring in other people, is to have conversations, not just to have me rambling into my microphones, although that certainly happens too. And so as promised, I do have some free media uh, for you all to enjoy today. One is the, I screwed it up the last time I talked about this particular band, because I think I called them the Mannequins. And I think I got the band and album name backwards. It's actually Monster Cat is the band name, and Mannequins is the album name. And so I have been listening to this album over the past couple of weeks, and it's been growing on me. It's actually a pretty good album. And so uh, although I did play kind of the main song from it a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to play another track from that same album today, and that'll be Underwater. So that'll be the second thing I play. And then, of course, the first thing I'm going to play is going to be another clip from a GNU Funk Radio, which is a defunct radio station that used to be on the internet that you could listen to all kinds of free Creative Commons and uh, GNU GPL media that you could just freely listen to and share and do all that cool stuff with. Unfortunately, the metadata that came with that stream has long since gone, and so I have no idea who the musicians are anymore. So if you know who is the musician that made this piece, uh, definitely let me know, because I'd love to hear more stuff by them, and they are pretty good. So let's hear GNU Funk Radio uh, from GNU Funk dash AB dot MP3. That's my habit. We'll go from there.
Monster Cat with Underwater, and as usual, you can listen to that. You can cut that out of this piece and share it with your friends and go from there. So, what other than music is going on this week? See here. So, the first thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit more about C51 and what went wrong with C51, and in particular, the anti terror acts we've been collecting, and how, yes, we've got these laws on the books, and yes, we have have to get rid of them now. But is there anything other than the things we've kind of already talked about in the previous shows that have come to lead us to the point where we have these laws on the books? Last week, I think it was, we, I talked a little bit about how the power in the Canadian government has been centralized in the Prime Minister's office. 
and how this wasn't always the case, how 20, 30 years ago, there was a great deal of power in the hands of the members of parliament who represented their writings. And so when laws would come out, there would be kind of a limit on how harsh they could be because the members of parliament would have to justify those laws to their constituents. And so you'd get stuff like NAFTA, for example, that was passed without the constituents really being able to read it or get a concept of what was in it. But that was more abnormal. It wasn't the norm. A lot of the, if the government tried to do anything like that, other than NAFTA, it would have had blowback. And in fact, there was blowback on NAFTA. There were protests. There were people in the street. There were people driving their combines to Ottawa. There was all kinds of resistance against it. And that resistance also clues other people that something is going on with those laws. We also had a, a media in this country that more or less worked, that kept people informed of what was going on with their government when the government tried to do stuff like that. And so there was this uh, ability of us to keep informed of what was going on in the world around us, including and up in, to Ottawa. And so there was that. And in addition to that, uh, we didn't have what we have today, which is the Trudeau government giving hundreds of millions of dollars to the media that cover them and kind of helping them come to the correct conclusion about which side or which parts of the administration or bureaucracy to support. There wasn't that that kind of conflict of interest going on. And so you could get, in principle, honest reporting on what resistance was going on and what was the actual important issues of the day rather than the media deciding what to cover and then covering it without regard to whether or not it was good for the Canadian public. There was that going on. But there's also something in the course of our education. We did have an education system that did kind of clue people in that we do have human rights here in Canada as well as rights guaranteed to us through our constitution and that those rights come with responsibilities to a keep informed and b make sure that when politicians try to take those rights away that they are resisted and so it's interesting to note though that when i went through high school and this is quite a few years ago uh, one of the things that was really kind of kept from us was when we were covering history the modern age wasn't really covered as much and it was always kind of considered to be too too close to home and too contentious to really go into in any depth. And yes, we did do current events in our social studies classes, and we did cover some of the things that was going on, but there always seemed to be this gap in the generation of our parents of what they thought and what they did in the political issues of their days. And sure, this sort of thing is probably covered in university courses in the social sciences, but it's interesting to note that we had reasons why the CSIS existed and why the RCMP is no longer charged with counterintelligence as much. As kind of mentioned in the last video, there was instances where they clearly, the RCMP clearly did illegal things and had been slapped down for it. And I didn't hear about any of that stuff until long after I was out of high school. So there's that to consider. So there, there's this educational side of the problem where we've seem to have neglected to teach the children of the current day and age that there used to be more rights than we currently have and that this was sort of taken for granted that we had uh, the ability to speak freely uh, amongst in, in private conversation and to uh, discuss the political issues of the world and even to to raise the possibility of doing things like for example Lord Byron did uh, when he went out and thought that there was a country being taken over by a brutal, evil political force, and he went out personally to help uh, resist it. Same thing George Orwell did the same thing. He went to Spain. He took part in the the violence against the Nazi-backed Spanish fascist regime that took over that country just prior to the Second World War. There were people who could go and dedicate parts of their lives to resisting tyranny and to resisting dictatorships and actually going and with their own hands and own possible own lives, actually going and doing something about the problems of the world, even at great risk to themselves. That was something that Canadians could do and did do. It was something that we could support, that we could talk positively about, and we could bring up as something to be emulated. Uh, that was all legal not that long ago. And so when we start looking at the restrictions from what we can say and what we can promote in the here and now, there is an aspect of history that I think is largely forgotten at this point. And as well, I've been noticing just walking around town, the number of young people who 
rely on their phones to keep them informed. And their phones, of course, running proprietary software that is mediating everything that they interact through these systems that are basically <laughs> beholden to the powers that be here in the including but not limited to CSIS and RCMP who can shut things down. I was just watching last night the all watched over by machines of love and grace again and there's this kind of neat little segment in the first episode of that where they talk to the head, former head of Goldman Sachs who had a great deal of power in the US government in the late 90s and how the interests were presented as when they were deciding what policies to do, they had to argue for regime change of this, I think it was Indonesia at the time, because it threatened the global economic system, or at least the, the partners, the global economic partners, i.e. the global economic system, but also the interests of the U.S. And when they said the interests of the U.S., they mostly mean the interests of large corporate entities in the U.S. Same thing is kind of going on here, where if you threaten the large corporate interests, if you threaten the interests of the powerful, they will shut your system down. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some examples of when that has happened here, uh, kind of closer to home little later on. But I, I just want to point out that there's this failure in our education system right now, I think, from every account that I've heard of it, uh, to show how much of our freedoms we have lost over the past decade or two, and how important those freedoms are. And so that's one of the places where this has failed. Um, but I think part of it is just a cultural change and a shift because prior to 10, 20 years ago, there, Canada itself was younger. There was the average age of Canada has been slowly creeping up. Right now, I, I think, think my understanding, understanding is that I am kind of the average age right now. And this is the, it has taken to me to get to this point in my life where I've just been slowly approaching the average age. But as I've been getting older and older, the average age has been going up. Slowly I've been catching it. But still, the point here is that when the population as a whole ages, we get more and more complacent with the status quo. When we are young and we are kind of not included in the system around us. When we don't have that job, we don't have that career we've been striving for a decade plus to keep. We don't have a retirement with savings that are the thing that keeps bread on the table. Then we are more interested in making sure that the if we're going to be having systems in our lives, that they actually represent the interests of both the people as a whole. Once you have something to defend, something to keep from others, it gets very tempting to just want to defend that thing at the cost of others and their well-being. And so one of the things I think with C51 is that it's very tempting to just say, okay, well, as long as it doesn't affect me in my retirement, I'm okay with it. As long as it doesn't cause the taxes to go up, the capital gains taxes or the income taxes or the funeral taxes and the things that I've worked so long and hard to keep, then who cares? It's someone else who's being locked up. It's not going to be me and my children. And so there is this tendency, I think, for older people to be willing to put up with more and more restrictions on what people can do as long as it doesn't affect them personally. So I think that's part of it. But I think the other part, we can't blame the whole thing on the old. Right, because the young aren't voting. And so, again, going to the education thing, historically speaking, and looking like we're going to see the same thing in this current election, there's this whole part of the younger generation that is just apolitical and doesn't care to be informed and doesn't care that they have no rights uh, worth speaking of. And that they, had they been born 20 years prior, they would have been proud to say, oh, hey, yeah, I've got this Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I'm not in the Soviet Union, so I can say and do whatever, uh, or at least not whatever I want, but at least within limits, a great deal. But nowadays we've, we've lost this value with the, the young too, because we haven't cultivated it. We haven't made sure that it's a valued thing worth fighting for. And we've done stuff like get ourselves into the Afghanistan war, which again, was not something that would have spread freedom per se, despite the fact that it was built that way. And so we've got, got a whole generation of people that when they think of causes that were fought over for freedom, they'll think of stuff like the, the Afghan war and fighting to defend poppy fields for the CIA's uh, supply of drugs to the world, right? So we'll, we'll get into problems like that where it's hard not to be bitter and it's hard not to give up hope. 
but at the same time there is this this thing worth fighting for there so there's that the other thing too other than the education system our political system our our willingness to stand up of the changing demographics i think there's also like we, we've allowed ourselves to be too comfortable in a sense and it is going to cost uh, a great deal of political capital to take this law out and i think part of it is going to be we are going to have to get used to uh, a lower standard of living honest to god i, I think we are uh, as a country because it is going to not be taking c51 out is going to be costly there are going to be things that we're going to have to give up and of course this is really hard from my perspective to argue for right because you've got your cushy cushion your cushion beneath you like you, you should, if there was a way to, for me to give up that cushion in exchange for getting rid of C-51, I would do it. But I think it's going to take stuff like that, though. And that, that is why. Like, when, when people look at me and say, you know, why are you working with the NDP so much? Why, why are you spending so much of your time trying to get rid of the, these laws? Well, I mean, I have the ability to do so, and therefore I have the responsibility to do so. I just hope that more people with the ability also start noticing that they share that responsibility and to start living up to it too. So, you know, take from my example of that one, if you can. So there's that. The other thing I kind of wanted to talk about is the, so after C-51, or, or rather after Trudeau was elected, rather, there there was talk of reforming C-51. And so there was a little bit of hope in the progressive community that Trudeau would actually do something about C-51 and that maybe some of the worst parts of it would be taken out and indeed one or two of the worst parts of it uh, by c49 uh, were taken out but um let's go into the kind of details of what exactly happened there when they tried it. quote this is from the canadian civil liberties association quote another important step is the elimination of the criminal offense of advocating or promoting terrorism offenses in general which is replaced by less vague and less overbroad counseling the commission of a terrorist offense so it's like a step in the right direction, but it's still going to be a crime to counsel, again, be willing to resist tyranny using force and to uh, help counsel the resistance of that tyranny. So there's that. But anyway, continuing on, quote, in the coming days and weeks, we'll be undertaking a detailed review and analysis of C-59. Of particular concern, CSIS's lack or ability to ask for warrants that limit charter rights. The lack of special advocates who can ensure the protection of people's rights in specific cases. Safeguards ensuring the accuracy and reliability have been added to Security Canada Information Sharing Act, but most problems of creative remain unsolved. Despite certain limited improvements, processes surrounding the no-fly lists are still secret and individuals are not entitled to a special advocate to defend their rights when they want to appeal being placed on the list. New provisions regarding the collection and treatment of data sets by intelligence agencies without a judge's supervision in some cases raise privacy concerns. The CCLA continues to have serious concerns about the CSIS's disruption powers, i.e. the ability to not go after people doing illegal things, but just to keep people from acting generally. So if, if they want to disrupt you in your protest movement, they can do it. So continuing on. C-59 also introduces new issues into the conversation. In particular, the bill appears to significantly expand the mandate of Canada's Signals Intelligence Agency including creating a framework of active cyber operations of hacking foreign individuals or states, which, by the way, some countries treat that sort of things as an act of war, right? including the United States and Russia, I believe. So it's worth considering that the, quote, active cyber operations, unquote, i.e. stuff like shutting down uh, dams and doing stuff like Stuxnet uh, to uh, the Iranians and keeping them from realizing nuclear power, things like shutting down a whole city's sewer treatment plants, basically terrorism by another name. Continuing on, CCLA will continue with detailed examination of Bill C-59 and will continue our public engagement and advocacy work that to demand that national security and intelligence agencies operate in a fully charter compliant manner which they are certainly not right now. This is from Michael Geist, quote, a budget implementation bill is unlikely, and many would say an inappropriate place to make major changes to Canadian privacy law. Yet C Bill C-59, the government's 155-page bill, is set to sweep through the House of Commons does just that. So, um, pause. The So this is 158-page. Like, I haven't... I, actually, you know, I think I may have even read C-59. I'm not even sure at this point. Let me just double check. 
no, it looks like I have not. So it's another omnibus bill. It's got a whole bunch of stuff in it, probably creating little exceptions here and there while sidestepping the problem that C-51 was on the books in the first place. So trying to basically salvage it and keep it despite the public blowback on it. The omnibus budget bill touches on a wide range of issues, including copyright term extension and retroactive reforms to informational or access to information laws. So interesting how we have this like thing touching copyright, even though it's a terrorist thing. Okay. Anyway, long story short, it's in addition to changing terrorist law, also risks, uh, quote, when Pipedo was in, first introduced in the late 1990s, the government was careful to limit its scope to commercial activities. And the reason was that the Constitution grants provinces power over property and civil rights, which is where privacy fits in. To get around provincial jurisdiction, the federal government sought to regulate privacy on a national basis by relying on its trade and commerce power. Kind of similar to how in the states, uh, I think it's uh, Congress does kind of a similar thing where they have used the fact that interstate commerce is related to just about everything to expand its power to just about everything. So that's kind of interesting. Quote, in fact, Quebec viewed even that justification as an enrichment on its powers and quickly launched a constitutional challenge, challenge against the law. But that case has remained dormant for years. So let's pa pause for a moment and remember that for later. And then, so th th there is some... Um, little details here and there in C-59 that there is a little bit of positive change there. But in exchange for that little bit of positive change, we've also got CSIS elsewhere uh, has been given even more powers and even more ability to share the private information of Canadians and even more ability to undermine our both our democracy and democracies around the world, including stuff like manipulating foreign elections. Quote, instead of providing for reforms of privacy and accountability so that so that so many of us have asked for, the bill contains frightening new, quote, cyber operations powers, which would give near limitless, unaccountable power for Canada's spy agencies to do things like influencing foreign elections suppressing online news or blocking messaging apps. So stuff like Ricochet, perhaps, might be frustrated by the Canadian government restricting our ability to communicate privately. This is going to be one of the tools in their toolbox when they come for our ability to use crypto, which they are, in fact, coming for as part of the Five Eyes general push against cryptography used by citizens of not just their countries, but around the world. And so my point as of uh, last year, just about this time, was that if the Canadian government and CSIS has the ability and practiced the ability to manipulate foreign elections and their computer systems, it is very likely that they are going to do the same here. And so it raises then the question of, is this upcoming election going to be legitimate? I am pretty confident that the election in Thunder Bay was not legitimate. So far, I haven't heard very much from Elections Canada of moving towards computerizing the outside aspects of the voting system, i.e. when you go to the voting booth. That part I don't think is going to be on a computer, but the inside is. Once the ballots are counted, they are put into a computer to calculate the total vote. Having worked for Elections Canada before, I've seen that process on the inside, and that computer isn't necessarily going to be accurate if it is going to be manipulated by things like CSIS. So it's worth considering that this may we may already be in a post-democracy Canada. So uh, Canadian journalist for free expression, quote, all the narrowed scope of threat disruption powers and as mentioned above in this article, is an improvement on the existing legislation. It would be vastly preferable if the government would repeal charter violating powers in their entirety. While many illicit threat reduction or disruption tactics are a matter of common sense, the specific wording of some of the points gives us cause for concern. Federal judges should not be in a position to authorize CSIS to breach the charter, and this needs to be addressed. I.e., the charter is not the highest law of the land at this point. The highest law of the land is whatever the federal judges decide CSIS can allow us to do. Quote, police impersonating journalists. The threat reduction of power of impersonation could be taken to read that Canadian spies have the power to pose as journalists in the course of an investigation. And they kind of list the, the exact language there. Quote, this is a serious threat to freedom of the press, one that CJFE has stood up to against in court. It reduces public trust and compromises the relationship between the public and the media and between journalists and their sources. The CJFE is immediately awaiting passage of the Journalistic Source Protection Act, Bill S-231. I wonder how far that went. Oh, let's check legislative flow on that. Uh, Bill S-231. So this actually looks like it was passed and received royal assent. So that's good, at least. Quote, another problematic threat disruption power is the provision that allows spies to falsify records or publish 
false statements and in, for investigative purposes. In the context of fake news and propaganda, the ability to create false documents and disseminate them for investigative purposes presents a clear threat to our journalistic institutions. As with impersonating journalists, the prospect of CSIS potentially fabricating information for widespread public consumption undermines public trust and news media and blurs the line between what is real and what is disinformation. And then they talk about the ability to do overseas hacking and then suggest that we kind of go forward and fix it. So that's the Canadian Journalist for Free Expression's points. But the, the point here is that it's not enough to just trade away some parts of our freedom for some other parts of our freedom, right? Like what the liberals seem to be trying to do is make it so that they can have like a never ending stream of things that they can give us. Because if they take away some of our freedoms and empower CSIS to do terrible things, they can at the same time of doing that, say that, oh yeah, we improved things. We did pass this journalistic protection. We did pass a little bit of modification of what you can and cannot say, okay. allowing you to be able to say more things and to promote general or more abstract and broad things that you would have been forbidden to promote prior to the Trudeau government. And then they'll promise a little bit more and a little bit more. But in doing so, every time they make a change, they take something else away. They take something else that we can rely on a way. They, they add more powers to CSIS. They add more powers to CSEC. And so the next election, we'll be able to fight over the things that they added. And they'll be able to say, oh, yeah, well, we fixed this little part of the problem. But in doing so, they'll just add something else that we'll have to fight about later. So this is what happens when we enable the liberal party specifically to make these kinds of changes, because that's the way that they've, they've been doing things for the past three decades. They have not made things better. They've only made things worse. And every time there's a terrorist attack, the ratchet tightens and we get more and more restrictive laws. So the next question is, what, what can we do to stop C-51? And I found this uh, article by Elizabeth May, which is still when it's going through its, uh, when it was still becoming law. Uh, but it made a, a couple of interesting points here. I want to see if I can go to, oh, here we are. So, quote, looking at the, the process of which our government, our members of parliament were allowed and not allowed to actually uh, interact with this law before or this bill before it became law. So, quote, it was the most anti-democratic treatment of legislation yet under the Harper Conservatives. And that's actually saying something, given how bad they were, quote, continuing on. And that's saying something. I don't think anything could be worse than C-38. That was the Harper government's omnibus bu uh, budget bill. Continue, at least I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Continuing on, at least in other committees, I was allowed to ask questions. Not once in the Public Safety Commission was I allowed to ask even one question, and the witnesses were treated abominably. Uh, the Globe and Mail editorial got it right when he referred to witnesses not being able to testify to the committee, but to witnesses, quote, allowed to be abused by the committee, unquote. The process by which Green MPs submit amendments to committee is one created by the Prime Minister's office to deprive me of my right to present substantial amendments at the report stage. I had used this right effectively in opposing C Bill C-38 in spring 2012, submitting over 400 amendments resulting in a 24-hour voting marathon. Since the fall of 2013, due to identical motions passed by the Conservatives in every committee, we are required to submit our amendments at two committee 48 hours before the committee gets to clause by clause. Since we are not allowed to be members of the committee, even temporarily, green amendments are deemed to be or to have been moved at committee. Bruce Heyer and I were given roughly one minute per amendment to present the rationale for the change, which is, that's just a joke, right? I mean, it's interesting that Bruce Heyer is mentioned here as someone who was part of giving 400 amendments to the omnibus budget legislation and an untold number of attempted changes that could have been made to C-51 uh, had they not restricted his ability to, to engage in the democratic process that way. Quote, Throughout the process, I presented concerns. The Conservative MPs would often accuse the Green Party of, quote, privileging the rights of terrorists over those of Canadians, or allege that we were in favor of terrorists. When I would ask for the floor to rebut, I was denied. It was a pretty brutal process. And then they talk about one of the situations where the Harper government did kind of agree to back down a little bit, basically making it so that they, quote, I pounded away the problems by created by saying the act did not apply to, quote, lawful advocacy, protest, dissent, or and artistic creation. It was a conservative amendment that removed the word lawful. But that should serve to better protect nonviolent civil disobedience. Pause. I'll also add an art, 
and art, <laughs> there is illegal art, and illegal art would not have been protected other than through that change, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, the point here is that the Harper government, and by the way, supported by the Trudeau liberals, did not do a thing, even when the other parties, such as the Greens, were trying to make amendments to it. They didn't even let their voices be uh, raised. They were just locked out of the committee in terms of being able to edit this as it was going through what should have been a democratic process of changing and finding the extreme parts of these laws and, and taking them out. That is not to the Harper government's uh, um, benefit that they did this and that Trudeau supported this. Again, uh, that is the record. That is what the Trudeau government has done and supports to this day. Continuing on this one. So what can we do? Well, we could repeal C-51. And that is the, we can get rid of any sections that are dangerous in the law uh, regarding, quote, pretty much the whole bill. Here are its five parts and a rough sketch of what they do. I'm not going to go into the what they do part, but the five parts are information sharing, no fly list provisions, thought chill sections, quote, part four, which is, quote, the most dangerous, it transforms CSIS, an agency designed to collect intelligence and share it with those who can act, to an agency empowered to disrupt plots, i.e. it takes the power to collect and spy on the whole world, or especially Canadians, and empowers them to act on that. Uh, one of the incidental, oh yeah, and then the fifth thing is there was quote, the final section, quote, it is so opaque and incomprehensible that it received virtually no attention in committee. No witnesses spoke to it. It changed the way information is going to a judge in support of a national secu or security certificate is handled. Uh, so basically, the purpose of this bill was to allow the evidence obtained by torture to be submitted to a judge without disclosing this fact, i.e. the evidence obtained by torture, which we can expect if they're making it easier to have evidence obtained by torture torture come into the, the justice system and be approved, then we're expecting torture to continue around the world in our favor, well, not our favor, but in the favor of the Canadian government. And so this this is enabling torture. This is, this is what our government is doing and something that we can repeal. We can get rid of this. How can we do this? Well, the first step is to elect people like Bruce Heyer in Thunder Bay Superior North, who was Again, one of the biggest voices against that. Re-elect people like Elizabeth Maines and Sandwich Gulf Islands to go down the list of the Greens and the NDP and the Bloc. The Bloc did eventually turn against the bill. Elizabeth Maine and the Greens did convince them, and the pr public pressure that they saw did convince them to, to basically stop this. And so, the long story short, it's, it is an election season right now. There is an election in Canada going on right now, and there are lots of writings that are not just going 100% to the Conservatives or the Liberals. There is a ability for, if you're a Canadian citizen, for you to vote and to actually have a chance at changing some of these bills. Here in Saskatoon, there are going to be two choices, uh, depending if you're on the east side of the river or the west side. On the west side, that choice is going to be Sherry Benson and the NDP. Uh, the NDP, again, have been the, the vocal voice against this sort of thing. Although I haven't heard much of the Sherry Benson office specifically on these, these kinds of issues, we can guarantee that the Conservatives are equivalent in Brad Redekop or whatever, is not going to help with this. He's not going to do anything to make this better. If anything, he's going to make things worse. And so the obvious choice here in Saskatoon West is Sherry Benson. On the east side, things are a little bit more complicated. There is the NDP Claire Card, which is probably the best chance of deceiving the Conservatives here. But it is a little bit of a long shot. So it's hard to say whether that or the the green vote is, is going to actually help things all that much here. But there are other places in Canada. And I have a list, uh, I'll probably post it, of a list of close writings where there is a choice to vote not for this kind of bill. And it's a big list, like it's a really close election this time. So there's actually quite a few writings where there's a, a big contest going on between something other than just the Liberals and the Conservatives. And there may even be a, a Liberal or two out there that we can count on to actually support freedom out there. And there are cases of even independents that are giving the big parties a bit of a run of their money right now. So if you are a Canadian citizen, the best way to get rid of these things is to vote. The other thing we can do, we can 
still write letters to our members of parliament, uh, we can keep each other informed and make sure that this issue is not put on the back burner. And that as the election goes on, we don't just forget that we've lost all these rights and that we've lost the ability to communicate privately and freely to a great extent. And that we've empowered CSIS to be this, this powerful entity that can do things around the world in our name while risking the, create, the starting of wars, the, the overthrowing of governments, the manipulating of foreign elections and domestic here as well, that we've lost all these things. And so it's worth making sure that the, this is not forgotten. So there's that. There's also, we can still, there is, it is possible still to, to do things in a kind of like a, a defensive measure. So that right now, uh, that's the other thing I kind of wanted to bring up, and I'm starting to run a little bit out of time. SaskTel went on strike this week. And SaskTel is directly res involved in this, more than probably I can mention publicly. But there is a level of which, if you think about it, right, if we've got CSIS that is spying on the whole of the country, do you imagine that maybe, similar to the states in at and and Hepting, where there's a, a secret room in at and where all cables have to go through, how much of that has SaskTel disclaimed, right? Like, has has have the reporters here in Canada or here in Saskatchewan actually asked to see, is there any such room, right? That might be something worth kind of digging into a little bit from the reporter's perspective, is how much, where are the, 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 the tentacles of CSIS and CSEC in regards to SaskTel? Um, is, it, is there nothing there to be found, or is there something, right? And then, if that's the case, can we make... Can we get more action on that from the perspective of the workers who have to implement this sort of thing? That's something to think about anyway. And so there's that. But just the fact that there is a strike is, is kind of suggesting that there is another way of kind of addressing this, which is that the government needs the people of Canada to work more than the people of Canada need the government to be there for them, right? It's, it's possible to have a, a general strike. It is possible. Uh, and right now we are the closest Saskatchewan has ever been to a general strike. And so it maybe there's something there. Maybe there's the people who are currently reliant on SaskTel could make this about more than just the, the 001 that the strike is supposedly about. There is cause, or there, there's a potential for that, and I think it's, it's not, worth not overlooking. And so there's, there is the SASTEL strike going on. And so right now, I'm not using SASTEL. Uh, normally I would. It's kind of, it's the obvious choice if we're getting internet access and phone access here in Saskatchewan. You can either have a private company, or you can have a company that the profit that they're going to take, which is basically the same pretty close to the same price, even cheaper in many cases. But the profit that they take just gets either reinvested in the network locally, or it helps to pay the healthcare system here in, here in Saskatchewan. So it's a no brainer, but I've disconnected, seasonally disconnected my service so that I am not intervening in this strike. I'm not crossing that picket line. I'm not using the phone service of as, as far as I can tell. Now, the, there is gonna be some packets that still travel through the SaskTel network, uh, just the way that the internet is designed, that Shaw passes their packets to SaskTel, and then SaskTel passes it to Hurricane Electric or wherever else it goes. But the point here is that there is a strike on, and this is a major event, and thousands of people are involved in it. And there, the reason behind it is going to be that currently, that the Saskatchewan government is taking all the money, all the profit that SaskTel is taking, and not letting the management give even just like little breadcrumbs of a, a raise to the employees of SaskTel. Now that in and of itself, they'd probably be able to get away with, but they did this at the same time that they gave themselves, the members of the SAS party government, something like a 2.3 or 3% raise. And so while they're giving themselves a raise and giving the management a raise, they're not giving a raise to the employees. And the employees are just not putting up with that. So hence a strike is happening right now. And so it's it's worth, again, this is a Unifor strike. So Unifor is pushing for internet censorship and working closer with the Canadian government to restrict people's access to technology and restrict people's access to understanding technology and so on and so forth. So it is a little bit of a gray issue here. Um, but again, it's, it's worth considering that this strike can grow. Uh, it has already grown. The other crown corporations have all gone on strike or at least something like seven of them have gone on strike at the same time that SaskTel has in solidarity with them. Again, because they know right well that the end goal of the Saskatchewan party government is to privatize SaskTel. 
And so there, there is kind of like a fine line to walk, because if we all disconnect our service, we risk making SAS no longer profitable and making it easier for the Saskatchewan government to pull what they pulled with the STC and basically just shut it down with no recourse to anyone who uses it. But so it's, it is worth keeping SAS still around. But at the same time, it is there's a strike going on. And so the only thing that is worse than supporting a company like Shaw that doesn't even have a unionized workforce, as far as I understand, is to use a system that does have a unionized workforce and has locked them out and is by now probably trying to get scabs to work the, behind the picket lines. I haven't heard any reports of them successfully doing so yet, but it's something to be expected given what we saw with the co-op strike, given what we saw with what the Sask party tries to do elsewhere. So there is a possibility for a good outcome to occur here, but the union's position is very weak. And it, I, I don't have any doubt that if they were offered even a small, something close to what the premier and his buddies got, that they would take it. Even though they're also going to lose in the long run because the, the core of SASTAL is going to be privatized if we, can, if we don't get rid of the SASC party very soon. So there's that to consider. But, so there's the, the strike is going on. We, I don't want to go too much further into it because I am running out of time. And let's see. Oh, right. And so I, I do have a little bit of record media this week, but I want you out there to go find a copy. Um, don't necessarily pay for this one, uh, but uh, this is the InfoWars, quote, powerful new free speech documentary. Quote, you can't watch this. Learn how big tech silences for patriots to control discourse. And uh, I don't think they have any really write-up on it in this particular article, but there is it's a new InfoWars documentary. And so if anyone has a copy of this, I would love to get access to it. Uh, definitely send me a link if you've got like a torrent or something to watch this. Again, don't necessarily give them any money, but I think it's actually going to be potentially an interesting watch. And so this is, this is my recommended media for this week. And with that, I'm going to end this show. So if you've enjoyed this broadcast, please consider subscribing on subscriberstar.com. Uh, if you can look for Jeff Cliff under Subscriberstar somewhere, it should be in there. And as usual, if you have anything you'd like me to talk about, send me an email or leave a comment wherever this video is posted, and I'll try to get to it in a bit. As well, if you have any creative comments or other free music that you'd like me to broadcast, also definitely give me a link to that, and I'd love to hear it. So I will see you all next week, and thank you all for listening.